There we go. All right. Edith Wharton relates in her autobiography, A Backward Glance, that my visual sensibility must always have been too keen for middling pleasures. From the age of four, when she was playing in the Roman Forum, she found the surroundings incredibly beautiful. She would remember long sunlit wanderings on the springy turf of the great Roman villas, yet deeper impressions were gathered in walks with my mother on the daisy-strewn lawns of the Villa Doria Pamphili. Among the statues and stone pines of the Villa Borghese. Still later, she would recall the warm scent of the box hedges on the Pincian and the texture of the weather worn sun glit stone. Victorian America, by comparison, was a source of inarticulate misery for I was always vaguely frightened by ugliness. The story of her first novel, The Valley of Decision, which was published in 1902, is set in 18th century Italy. She would often be asked whether it was not pre preceded by months of hard study. I had never studied hard in my life. The truth is, I have always found it hard to explain that gradual absorption into my pores of a myriad details, details of landscape, architecture, old furniture, and 18th century portraits, the gossip of contemporary diarists and travelers, all vivified by repeated spring wanderings guided by ghosts and the Chevalier de Brosses by Goldoni and Gonzi, Arthur Young and Ippolito Nievo. The tale is saturated with the atmosphere I had so long lived in. One consequence of the success of the Valley of Decision was a commission by Century Magazine to write a series of articles titled Italian Villas and Their Gardens. She spent the first four months of 1903 in northern Italy visiting and studying the subjects at hand. The illustrated articles appeared in the magazine over several months, in 1903 and 1904, and then in book form in 1904. As the title of the book indicates, Edith Wharton observes the Italian gardens are the prolongation of the house, that the superior garden was composed of a series of logically related enclosed spaces. Of all the homes that Edith Wharton created for herself, there were seven in her lifetime. The Mount, her first real home, was the only one she planned and had built from start to finish. From the purchase of 113 acres of farmland in Lenox, Massachusetts, and the design and construction of the house, stable, lodge, and greenhouse, an ensemble completed in 1902, to the completion of the garden late in 1905. It's... She... Well, I don't want to go into that. I want to... Skip that just for a second. Um, <clears throat> in, this, in the house and formal gardens, Edith Wharton gave thorough consideration to the crucial relationship to scenic views, to the sun, and to the existing terrain. At the top of a meadow sloping three quarters of a mile down to Laurel Lake was a hill, and at its base, a brook flowing diagonally from left to right. Now, one could see a middle ground view of the brook meandering down the meadow to a pond with the lake and the mountains in the background. 
Mrs. Daniel Chester Fringes Stockbridge wrote in her autobiography, Memoirs of a Sculptor's Wife, The Mount is an example of what can be done in landscape gardening by developing every little natural beauty. Instead of going in with preconceived ideas and trying to make it like some other beautiful place, which the lay of the land bears no resemblance whatever. Between 1903 and 1905, Edith Wharton planned and created the gardens. Beatrix Jones spent the summer of 1903 at her aunt's summer home, recuperating from surgery, and undoubtedly, the two consulted each other further on laying out of the gardens. The aunt certainly consulted others, but it is strongly assumed that she was primarily her own landscape designer, drawing on accumulated knowledge. The composition is tripartite in form. By standing on the terrace and facing Laura Lake, the visitor could view the design before him. The center section of the tripartite design consists of three descending lawn terraces each classically bordered with hemlock hedges and arbor vitae. To the left was the principal flower garden laid out on the same level as the bottom lawn terrace and within sight of Edith Wharton's bedroom windows where she wrote every morning. Also on the same level to the far right was the partially sunken weld garden walled garden, a graveled 300-foot lime walk bordered by lime-scented linden trees connected the two parties. The formal plan of the red flower garden consisted of concentric rectangles um, with the outermost dimensions 115 feet by 100 feet. The centerpiece of the garden was a rectangular pool with the dolphin fountain. Axial paths broke an inner rectangle of turf into four L-shaped beds with topiary shrubs at the ends, framing an outer path for magnificent 12-foot wide flower borders. Edith Wharton describes her flower garden to a friend Sarah Norton in July, 1905. It is really what I, I thought it never could be. A massive bloom. Ten varieties of phlox, some very gorgeous, are flowering together. And then the snapdragons, lilac and crimson stalks, pincinimions, annual pinks, and every shade of rose, salmon, cherry, and crimson the lovely white psychophysia, the white petunias, which now form a perfect hedge about the tank, the intense blue delphinium, the purple and white placidonian, etc. Really, with the background of hyhocks of every shade from pale rose to dark red, it looks for a fleeting moment like a garden in some civilized climate. In the House of Mirth, the main character, Lily Bart, stands at the window of a country house gazing upon a landscape, which was Edith Wharton's ultimate vision for the mount. The window stood open to the sparkling freshness of the September morning, and between the yellow boughs, she caught a perspective of hedges and parterres leaning by degrees of lessening formality to the free undulations of the park. The great financial success of this book allowed the writer to realize the completion of her garden, Segreto, or Secret Garden. This garden, which Frances Hopton apparently helped design, is partially sunken, taking advantage of the terrain which slopes into the meadow at this point. The ten-foot high stone walls were built on the east, west, and south sides, encompassing a garden 80 by 80 feet. The west wall was essentially a retaining wall, 
while the other two were freestanding, the east wall facing the meadow was punctuated by arched openings on either side of a grape pergola supported by stone piers. The pergola projected into the meadow, linking the formal garden room to the pastoral landscape. The plan of the garden was cruciform, with a circular pool bordered by petunias and a fountain in the middle. Edith Wharton's Italian garden design was now complete. The neatly hedged paths of pea gravel and rough cut stone steps were the unifying horizontal elements. Vertical elements, including obelisks and statues on the terrace, balustrades, topiary cone-shaped arbor vitae on the lawn terraces, and at the steps leading down to the sunken garden, and sprays of water thrown into the air in the center of each parterre provided human scale in the foreground while mimicking the trees, pines, cedars, maples, and elms in the wooded background. The gardens, as well as the house, are presently under restoration.